Good afternoon, good evening, better late than never. Uh, we are 10 minutes behind time. Today is Inspire and Be Inspired. Thank you for being here. I am joined by two of the UK's finest music heads, the most revered names in the country. Uh, two gentlemen that I've already spoken to before in the past. Uh, we are going to have a slight conversation about the interviews that we done with them uh, individually, find out if there are any things that I didn't ask them about or I forgot to double check. And then uh, I have a few points here that we're going to discuss. So without further ado, because we are running late, let me go to this button here and welcome along Mr. Jonathan Woodlith and Colin Curtis. Good afternoon, gentlemen. How are you? Hi, Andy. Good afternoon. Good evening. Yeah, good evening, it's, yeah, good evening here. It's all right if you live in Spain. Uh, Different go. time. Okay, so I am just making sure I can bring up my window so I can see some uh, conversations. So you you talk amongst yourselves, guys. Just say hello. You know, just just have you spoken we'll today? You I, I spoke to him earlier on. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, we've all we already worn that conversation out. Um, <laughs> are you in the garage? <laughs> um, I'm in the room next to the garage. <laughs> oh right, it's very similar to where we were before. Um, but now, of course, you're in the, in the far north. Yes, yes, yes. Northern Lights. <laughs> closer, to, closer to the action. Yes. <laughs> right. How am I going to see these comments? Hmm. Depends what they are. Do you need to see them? <laughs> well, yeah, because we want to make this as, as interactive yeah, yeah, of as possible. I'm your leg. I know, I know. Right. How do I find this? Bear with me. Technology. Um, So live i am here right right i've got you i've got the comments here martin brotherton says good evening martin from leicester Hi, uh, martin. my good friend amy is here <clears throat> let me try and find where all of these comments are uh the next comments that i see Yes. So how, how can people access these comments, Andy? How, where can Through we my this? wall, so if you've got the um, the event that we shared or you just share the link to my wall, then okay. uh, it should be actually live on my wall. Okay, it, one second. I need to try and find the, the dashboard, but what's going to happen is the moment I change this. Okay, bear with me, everyone. I'm just going to – you guys are still there. Right, yeah, yeah. I'm going back to this window, everyone with me, bear with me. I need to change here, pop out these comments. Just talking myself through this as I'm doing it, actually. Bring them over to here. There we go. You've got an author back. queue. <laughs> no, I, I've seen, I've done the, I've really done what I didn't want to do. There, now we're back. Now we're back. So let me say good evening, Amy, Martin, Joanne, Steve, uh, and anybody else that's with us live. Of course, if you're picking up the recording, a very uh, shaky start, but let's get to this. Thank you all for being here. Jonathan and Colin, thank you. Thank you uh, for you're your welcome. time. Uh, Wendy says, uh, Wendy here from Standish in Wigan, and my good friend Emily, who's had a hell of a week, says good evening. Hello, my love, and a shout out to Bye, Wendy. as well. Bye, Wendy. I'm Amy. Um, and Eddie Hubbard says hello as well. Uh, we I'm, I've, got a, I've got a four-hour four radio show tomorrow night with Eddie Hubbard, so he's coming down to Stoke-on-Trent. He doesn't know what he's let himself in for. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. One, one, of, one of the UK's top soul collectors. Good, good, good. Well, we're honoured to have him with us and feel free, all of you guys watching live, if there's any comments that these um, heroes bring up that you want to reference, when there's a break in the conversation, I'll always do my very best to bring those watching into the chat because we want to make it, a, you know, a community thing. Because let's yeah. face it, guys, uh, the, the first, you know, the, the first cliche of the afternoon uh, this music that we know and love, it's all about the community, right? That's why we do this, to share the music with our community. I think you'd agree. Absolutely. I think, I think that's exactly why people became part of it. I mean, as, as you were growing up with kids, I mean, for me, in the 60s, when you were growing up as kids, um, you know, 
certain ones of us didn't didn't want to go out and just have a drink and have a flight and just get drunk and uh, that that wasn't part of it so to to come across what was uh, you know back in the 60s the beginning of um uh, an underground soul scene in the uk actually happening in clubs i actually signed for uh, the mecca organization in 1967 um and was given a soul night on a thursday originally and eventually two nights thursday and but but yeah i, th- I think people joined in because the, they felt a connection with other like-minded people and and the music became the reason that people were congregated together mm-hmm. beautiful well myself being <clears throat> born in the seven uh, well 1970 i was going to say in the 70s growing up through uh, many changes in the musical landscape a, a lot of my generation say we we witnessed a lot of firsts but i think it's fair to say that you guys witnessed most of the firsts right you you reinvented the the, the, la- the landscape of uk music and and, and well, I, I, I listened this afternoon to the um, brilliant interview you did with marcia carl last week uh you know marcia is uh, you know serious dj and and she she's you know she's got she goes about her work and 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 does it properly i mean she you know she was discussing uh you know the different styles of djs and and the difficulty in in being recognized but back back in the original days nothing existed i mean probably the first sign from from my point of view that something was existing was when roger eagles came over and started to boot the acts and uh, also put djs on playing r and b music in the twisting wheel in manchester so we're going back to probably 65 66 um you know at that point i'm 14 years old i mean by 67 sorry uh, yeah, by 67, I'm 15 and three quarters and I had to say I was 16 to sign for Mecca so that I could work on a, on a Thursday night. Um, in those days, you DJed with a box of, well, a 50 count box with less than 50 records in. So plenty of repeats. Um, but these these records weren't, weren't easily available in the shops. There were records that I'd heard on pirate radio, uh, records that particularly stations like Caroline were getting hold of because Caroline were one of the first pirate stations to get the American releases that were being sent out to Europe, to the USAF bases. So they were they were playing imports. That, you know, I mean, none of this was on uh, UK radio. The closest was probably Mike Raven, a guy called Mike Raven, who used to open up with a, uh, a theme tune called Soul Serenade. And Radio Luxembourg as well were, were, were creeping into this. Um, but I suppose you know, local youth clubs then developed into club nights. Um, nothing existed really, nothing t- tangible, as I say, until the twisted wheel. And then for me, 1968, walking into the Golden Torch for the first time, and I saw the, a, another side to what I'd experienced with the Mecca, and that's um, independent independent clubs. And I described it to somebody as being like the inside of my head. I couldn't even believe it existed um, <laughs> because, because, you know, these guys were playing, you know, in 1968, Probably the biggest record in in the room was Sly and the Family Stone Dance to the Music. There was no, you know, already organised underground scene. This was this was work in progress. You know, the music was developing. Uh, Bobby Wells, Let's Copper Groove, Chubby Checker, all these records were thrown together along with whatever new releases uh, on the day. And so the bandwagon breaking down the walls of heartache, all these records were thrown together. And what developed out of this was was a rare soul scene, mainly playing UK label stuff, which had been licensed from the States. But by 1970, American records were coming in through Record Corner, you know, different outlets, um, there was a place down in um, uh, down in Hampshire as well, uh, FL Moore, uh, Bedfordshire actually, that uh, that used to bring in import records. So most people didn't take any notice of import records because they had a big hole in the middle and nobody had a record player that had a big hole in the middle. So you had to have, have a record player with an adapter on or buy the triangular or uh, three-way adapters to, to play these records. But I'm yes, going to ask a very. I'm well, going to ask well, a very well, obvious yeah, question. When I, when I hear somebody saying 88, 89 was 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 the beginning of house music, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it was way before that. It was way before that, obviously in America, but also over here. 
So, so the development was completely different for us. The, you came on to a semi-established scene, you know, following on from jazz funk yourself, probably. Mm -hmm. It'll be By that it'll time, be interesting. Bir 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 Birmingham was one of the toughest places in the UK, one of the toughest underground black music cities in the UK. When you say toughest, and I'm going to come to you shortly, Jonathan, when you say toughest, toughest to break, toughest... T tough toughest to be a DJ. They didn't suffer fools. If you couldn't play the right music, you weren't going to last five minutes in Birmingham. And mm -hmm. and that was the template. I'm not saying that the other cities were... were obviously easier but but for me to be able to be accepted in birmingham it, it was a tough urban city with brilliant dancers and a brilliant underground scene that was tied together with music and fashion mm, lovely we had a great conversation with yourself um and mr neil rushton uh, as part of the brummers fuck series where we focused mainly on how pivotal birmingham was uh, and then we would have mentioned the um, pilgrimages up to Nottingham. Then, Jonathan, you and I had a great conversation talking about the Palais and the Rock City. Uh, everything that uh, Colin has just said uh, resonates strongly with you, right? It does, absolutely. I mean, you know, I'm a, a little bit younger than Colin, so my, my um, sort of learning of music was a similar sort of thing where you know, I'd, I'd gone to the mainstream clubs, didn't like the atmosphere, the attitude, you know, the, the whole idea of going to a club on a Saturday night, get drunk, have a fight, you know, a, a go home. That kind of culture wasn't for me. And some friends at school um, took me down to a club in Nottingham called The Brit at Trent Bridge. So that was the first my first introduction to hearing Northern Soul Records and Danny was the DJ down there and he was like a feared person. You, you know, he wouldn't suffer fools coming and asking for silly records. So, you know, people used to say, don't go and ask Danny for any records, whatever you do. <laughs> so, I, you know, I went down, I was still at school. Um, I, I, I went down with... Um, some friends of mine who were a year above me, they took me down and I'd, it was just, wow, they, this is what I want to hear. I, yeah, I want to go somewhere where I can hear this kind of music. I, you know, I've been told what it was, but, you know, I've not heard any of it before. It, it wasn't pop music. You know, it certainly it was completely different to what was getting played in mainstream clubs. I, I just fell in love with it mm -hmm. and that was it you know i was out every weekend you know not not only going to these going to these nights um in nottingham uh but also the, the first all night i went to i caught a train from nottingham up to sheffield went to samantha's uh, uh nightclub where john vincent used to do uh an all-nighter there um um, Ian Dewhurst used to play in the back room. Uh, that that was, you know, a Northern Soul all nighter. You know, and I used to travel up there uh, on the train regularly. And you know, straight away, the the the, um, the thing that, that I wanted was to buy these records that I heard. So you know, I was hearing great records that I, I wanted to own, and that was it. It was find these records by hook or by crook almost <laughs> use every bit of spare cash i had you, know, to like you, were, you were hooked records. you you were hooked from from oh, there well and truly. Well and truly. for the next yeah. x amount of decades now most yeah. most of the people that we're talking to now um who will get to see this they are you know we're preaching to the converted so to speak but should this ever fall into the hands of someone long into the future it's difficult to try and paint a picture of just how underground the scene was at the time because there's been so much documented over the years about the scene and about the music uh, sometimes i believe and i may be wrong you were the guys to put me right uh, that it was just so underground that it is difficult, really, to 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 get that across to people. Is is that a fair observation? It was it, it, originally it it was very localized. There wasn't much traveling going on, 
Um, I would say Twisted Wheel, uh, the Mojo in Sheffield, the Blue Orchid. Um, you know, there were there was clubs dotted around the country and, and also in London, um, but very much based on live bands and DJs were were evolving at this stage in the sixties. Um, and I think that the rare soul scene as it evolved out of R and B. Um, and particularly what became the Northern Soul scene, um, then clubs started to appear. I mean, Jonathan's talking about the Brit in Nottingham and, and then travelling to Sheffield to, uh, you know, to Samantha's. I mean, and, and Mecca picked up on this very quickly because Mecca would have all the major bands. So major soul artists like uh, Sam and Dave, Arthur Conley, um, Wilson Pickett, Jackie Wilson, these were all brought in. You could go and see them on a Tuesday night. People would kill to see acts of that caliber now. It doesn't happen. Um, it, you know, but black music was being introduced in this country. Uh, their music was being borrowed, stolen, or whatever else by the Rolling Stones or the Beatles or, or anyone else. And you know, the Motown thing was 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 starting to happen. So it was very exciting in what was really. Um, you know, people talk about. Um, you know, there being a depression now, there being, you know, everything being downtrodden. You try, try living in the sixties and seventies, but there was there was a better mental attitude towards it, and it, it for me just a fantastic time. But yeah, it, the the underground scene, as as this scene developed, I mean, for the after the torch all nighters, which ended in uh, early seventy three. Uh, the police decided on that one. But towards the end of 72, when I left the torch, um, I took what was my first gig outside of Stoke-on-Trent. Stoke-on-Trent's where I live, and that was the only place you DJed in those days. You DJed in your locality, whether it was the youth club, whether it was you know, Tiffany's, Crystal Ballroom, uh, you know, the, the Golden Torch. They were all in Stoke-on-Trent. So the first booking I took, and this is really, you know, this is top-notch gigs, I was at the co-op in Warrington with Brian Ray. You know, that was the first gig I played outside of Stoke-on-Trent. And then it built. It was Burton-on-Trent. It was making connections. People were now travelling to originally the Twisted Wheel, the Mojo and the clubs I've mentioned, Blue Orchid. And now people were travelling to the Golden Torch, Blackpool Mecca. Uh, you know, the all-nighter at the Golden Torch probably was the reason that Blackpool Mecca closed. But that, that started to play soul about 1970. So you've got this underground set of people who were connecting without the internet, using telephones, using word of mouth, whatever, connecting with each other and all travelling to specific clubs that were playing this music. Mm -hmm. would, how much of this would you say was um, fuelled by the love of the music and how much of it was fuelled by... Uh, young hot-blooded males going out of town looking for women in different cities because I know we were going on. I don't, I get, yeah, I'm, I'm, music. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that was a percentage of it. As 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 would be chemicals. Chemicals was definitely a part of staying up all night. And mm -hmm. chemicals, you 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 grew up in in, in the worst era of chemicals. The best, if, if, I'd say the best. Yeah, the best. <laughs> <laughs> if uh, the police wouldn't agree, but yes, if. If, for instance, you took the, the chemical intake at, at, say, the wheel and the torch, because of, of, of the lack of product, <laughs> you could probably say the problem, although the, you know, if it if hit the newspapers, then the club would be doomed. But the problem was probably 30 to 40 percent, whereas in the 90s, the problem was 90 percent. Exactly. <laughs> it was exactly. very much, uh, you know, very much a part of the culture. So women... To, to a lesser extent, sadly, <laughs> would be the reason that people would travel. But music and actually camaraderie were the two reasons that most people travel. Beautiful. <clears throat> great, great answer. Thank you. My memories, uh, much, much later on, of, of coach parties from Birmingham to Nottingham to Sheffield to uh, Manchester and further afield were fueled, of course, for the music. But it was always, you know, as a young, uh, as an older teenage lad, like, yeah, you know, find the women wherever, wherever they may be. Um, so let, let's find out because your your histories are very well documented, both of yours. But uh, let's focus on where, because you sent me some great photographs, Colin, of the two of you together. You talk about camaraderie. How did you guys 
uh, spark up your friendship and um, how did it become solidified over the years? I'll leave that to John. <laughs> I, I suppose for me, um, the first time I met Colin was um, some lads from Nottingham said, we're going up to Blackpool Macaron on a Saturday night, taking a car up, do you want to come up? And I said, yeah. So up I went, managed to get in, up that escalator, into this top room with a tartan carpet, low ceiling, great, acoustically perfect. Great atmosphere, hardly knew any of the records being played, but they were all what I wanted to hear. Um, there was people with record boxes selling records and, you know, familiarised myself with the room and never been one to be shy. Um, I looked over, saw this tall guy with long, dark hair leaning over the deck, queuing up a record, and this record came on and I was like, I know this record, I'm... I need this record. And I went over and it was Colin. And I said, you don't want to sell that, do you? And his answer was, no. <laughs> and that was it. That's the first time I'd actually met Colin and spoke to him. And the record was Bernie Williams ever again. And then um, because of the distance traveling from Nottingham to Blackpool, it wasn't something I did on a regular basis because there was lots of other clubs that I used to go to you know, on a Friday night, a Saturday night, and a Sunday around the Midlands. So there was a choice of other venues to go to. So, you know, I I went up a few times to Blackpool. And I think the next time I had a conversation with Colin was Colin had come down to see Kev Roberts at Record Haven on Regent Street in Nottingham. Uh, Kev had just come back from the States uh, uh, with a shipment of records and Colin you came over um, that time I think I was still at school um, and you came over to buy records and Kev introduced us and that, right, was, yeah. that was the yeah. next time that I had a conversation with Colin and then you know because we'd been being able to talk away from a club and records get you know Colin was DJing at the Mecca and that I was a customer. You couldn't strike up a conversation because you were DJing at the time. So um, we had that conversation, you know, with Colin um, at Record Haven. And then it, it developed from there, really. And it was when, I suppose, we spent more and more time talking when Colin... Um, the, the evolution of, uh, of black music in this country um, where Colin had started playing, this this would be mid-70s, I would say, uh, where the, the start of what we call the jazz funk scene. So you had uh, events all day as around the country where one room would be Northern Soul, and the other room would be jazz funk. So I would still be playing Northern Soul records, but I was also buying um, these new release 12s because I'd go in the other, I'd do my set, uh, and then I'd go in the other room to hear, you know, whoever was DJing in the jazz funk room. And at Birmingham, it was Dave Till, and it was Colin and Graham War, um, Sean Williams, and, you know, and around the country there was a lot of all days that were like that one room was northern soul the other one was just funk so i was able to you know hear those new 12s and albums that were getting played and i'd go and buy those because kev at uh, record haven w was also bringing 12s and albums over as well as northern soul singles so i was able to pick up things i liked and obviously i'd have a conversation with colin and and also in Nottingham, there was a night starting there where the Italian club on a Thursday night, Mick Fields and Roman would DJ in there playing, you know, what was the 
the, the jazz funk scene in its infancy. I would go there on a Thursday night because it was local. Uh, then I would also, uh, on a Sunday night, uh, there was uh, a night at the Palais downstairs in the Ballet High in Nottingham where, um, I think, I forget what it was called, but Kev, Kev Thomas from Arcade Records DJed in there. And I'd go down there occasionally. But more often than not, I'd be at an all day or somewhere around the country on a Sunday where after going to an all night or on Saturday night, I would then go to an all day on a Sunday. And if I wasn't DJing, I'd go socially or take a coach from Nottingham. So I would end up where I would be it, possibly DJing in the Northern Room and then going into the Jazz Funk Room to see Colin or whoever and hear th those kind of records and over a period of time. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd well, Colin will tell you the story. Uh, what happened one day at, uh, at the Palais at Nottingham um, when I decided to um, get don't, rid of it. Don't, don't the and move on with the future. <laughs> yes, <laughs> welcome to the future. <laughs> yeah. uh, give, give in to the resistance and uh, move think, up, moving you, over. You see, you see, Jonathan and I, similar roots really, where, where initially 60s soul, into 70s soul. By 1973, the sound in America started to change. Uh, instead of it being James Brown or ballads to get on American radio, it became the beginning of dance music. Yet they were putting out records on small labels like Spring and Event and Innovation 2. But then the big labels cottoned on, RCA, Epic, Arista. Everybody got on board. And all of a sudden, we went crashing into disco with labels like Delight and the the innovative format of the 12 inch single. So I can remember getting side effect and can function all these records on promo American 12s were just mind blowing stuff. So at Blackpool Mecca, which had essentially been the Northern soul club up until uh, well, 73, we, I, I continued to play Northern soul there as part of the format, probably until 75, 76, but then the new releases had taken over. And I used to have what they call the last hour at Blackpool Mecca and started to experiment as time went on, 77, 78, Patrice Russian, Azar Lawrence, um, Donald Byrd, and started to introduce, you know, the last poets. Uh, you know, I'm playing these records to essentially what was a Northern Soul crowd, but they all had that epiphany that Jonathan's just spoken about, the epiphany that, wow, this is about music. So when I decided to leave Blackpool Mecca in 78 and go to Manchester, quite a lot of people said to me, nobody will follow you there because you're not playing rare records anymore. You're playing new releases. The amount of quality new releases between 1976 and 1985 is unprecedented on all formats, unprecedented. Absolutely. The black, the black music industry in the States just, just blew everything uh, you know, completely our way. So... You know, at that time, it developed what became uh, through all days and, and uh, specialist nights in Manchester, Nottingham, Birmingham, Sheffield, Leeds, Bradford, this massive following for, I would say at the time, bigger than London, uh, massive following for jazz funk in, in the Midlands and the North. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, I want to say good evening to a few people, like I say, keeping it fully interactive. Uh, you'll both know the legend that is Malcolm Stretch. Uh, he says, good evening. Uh, Mr. Paul Sharp says an education right there. Dave Furs, who is possibly one of your biggest supporters, uh, Colin, <laughs> uh, he says the best times with the last hour at the Mecca. Derek Inman also says the Palais Jazz Funk or Dayers and Nighters with you two on the roster were inspirational. I cannot thank you both enough. Uh, a young gentleman who would have definitely been inspired by you both. Christian Woodger is saying it's fascinating. And uh, anyone else, uh, I'll scroll back and give a shout out to thank you all for being here. Um, with it being the 75th anniversary of, of Windrush this year as well, I, I spoke about the scene being underground. I think we also have to put a focus on how, how the, the, the landscape of the UK was as well. Uh, you know, sort of like racially, there was there was still a big divide, wasn't there? Maybe not so much as you're moving towards the 80s, but definitely in the early 70s, it would have been 
predominantly black music, that would have had an effect as well, right? It, okay, I, this 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 kind of comes up all the time, and and I've got to be honest. I, I mean, I was I was aware of Windrush, um, but it, it you wouldn't have heard the word Windrush in conversation with anybody uh, until you know the last I don't know five ten years. There were the the the, the actual connection um you know between the first uh, ships coming over from the west indies um yes very relevant as you get older and you look back at it and the northern soul scene was predominantly white people not yeah. because black people weren't allowed in but because there was hardly any black people around you know they weren't in the community not big enough numbers in in local communities but there were some people on you know steve caesar is a classic example uh, a yeah. guy who lives in london now and went down to london he was a black bull mecca boy also came from leeds he had the fashion he won the dancing competition at wigan casino there were a small percentage of black people that were coming to what were essentially originally northern soul gigs up tempo music but in london and, and probably some other places in the country, you, you, the, the the black guys would 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 be more likely to go along to clubs that were playing the funkier sounds, the James Browns, you know, the more underground funk sound, um, which I probably started to introduce at Blackpool. Now, Manchester Ritz would have been a great example of, of, of a catalytic club, whereas this had been essentially from '74 a Northern Soul venue. We'd had all the top artists, um, you know. It, Tainted Love, Gloria Jones, who at the time, of course, was going out with Mark Boland, uh, who came along in a blazer and short hair. First time I'd seen Mark Boland without a wig, <laughs> but very smartly dressed. Well done, Mark. But um, that developed it into the acts changing from Archie Bell and the Drells, and it, the acts now were changing to Players Association, Brass Construction, and, and this kind of you know, Roy Ayers, this kind of exposure. Roy Ayers, of course, played Birmingham, Locarno. Uh, Lonnie Liston Smith played Nottingham Palais. You know, these acts were coming in and the crowd was changing. It was going from when I originally went to Manchester in 78, I would say socially, uh, the crowd was still 70, 75% white. Um, but in six months, it was probably the other way around. So that was a massive social change. But for me, not, not an issue. People are people. Mm -hmm. There's good people and bad people. I don't see any colours. I don't see any coloured people. I just mm -hmm. see good people and bad people. People who want to come along and be part of something. So these guys were coming along, probably the first generation of people from the Windrush, the kids of, of the people who'd come over on Windrush, who previously, let's take Manchester for example, previously only been able to go to the Reno or Blues parties in Hume or around Moss Side. Now they were coming into the town. Uh -huh. So strangely, after 18 months in Manchester, we were locked out every Saturday night. You know, the jazz funk thing really had got a grip. And we got a, a phone call from the Manchester police. It, James Anderton, the head of the Manchester police, wanted to see us. And he wanted to know why so many black people were coming into town. <laughs> so we told him. Mm -hmm. Get yourself some imports from spinning records. Listen to them. You'll know why they're coming into town. <laughs> not, not for the reasons that you think. Not for drugs, not for trouble, not for anything. Because we didn't have any trouble. In fact, we, we, we were probably one of the first venues at that time that made sure we got multiracial people on the door. So there was, there was no issue with any of that. Wow. And the dress for... The dress policy, for instance, in those days with Mecca, if you came to Blackpool Mecca on a Saturday night, you hadn't got a tie on, you wouldn't get in. So there was a little shop across the road that sold Kiss Me Quick hats and ties in a box. So you could buy a tie with an elastic band, they'll stick it around, get yourself in. Once you were inside, upstairs, you were fine. But off. just to get past. Whereas this, you know, multicultural type club where we were hiring the club. This was nothing to do with the club. We were hiring it. We, we put the equipment in there. We put all the lighting in there. And this was our crowd. So this was, you know, happening in Manchester. It was happening in Nottingham. It was happening in Birmingham. Birmingham, Chaplins with Graham War, one of the most innovative DJs in the UK at the time. He was the guy who introduced records like, you know, the extended versions of disco records because the crowd, the dancers, 
the first generation jazz. I know we've got Malcolm Stretch in here. I class him the second generation with the Spats. He was one of the guys who connected Birmingham with London in the, on the jazz dance side. But originally, your Lance Lowe's, uh, your Baptist Twins, your Ricks and Ties, these... Me going down there on a Monday and watching these people dance to the instrumental breaks in 17-minute disco records, but then the evolution of music from Eddie Russ, from Manfredo Fest, all of a sudden, ping, in the head. We can play this jazzier sound. We can't. People can dance to it. And so that then evolved into the old days and everything else that was happening. It was a phenomenal time, a, a buzzing time. But I've heard stories, you know, I... And again, I'm not going to name names, but guys who went to, you know, they didn't let me in because I was black at Wiggy Casino. Or they didn't, I don't know. There must have been some of that, but not at any clubs that we ran. There was, there was no, there, there was no prejudice. But I am aware that certain organizations did run a prejudice ratio, shall we say, one in 20, one in 30, whatever it was. Uh-huh. But that, that wasn't part of our remit. Once we were able to control the club, it didn't matter. Well, it's be- it's beautiful to hear you you uh, recite that for us Ag- again, Jonathan. <laughs> you you're probably sat enthralled just like I am listening well, to the well, words. You see, the, the, when that change happened that, that Colin mentioned about Manchester, it was exactly the same in Nottingham. You know, it, it was just like you know the the, the jazz funk all days where, where they started. It was like. 70, 30, 80, 20, a white audience, and then suddenly it changed. But for us, it didn't change because everybody was there for the same reason. They wanted to hear and dance to that music. So, you know, we didn't look up at the time and go, Where's all the, how come there's all different people? It, it didn't make a, a, a jot of difference to us. Because I mean, it, it must have, it obviously. They came to us to hear the, hear the music. They wanted, they wanted to hear that music. You know, you know, like Colin said earlier on, there were so many great records released week in, week out. We were spoiled with American records. There was so much to play all the way through that period. There was just like a deluge of fantastic records that you could go out and buy and play. And as that scene, like Colin mentioned in Manchester, the same thing was happening in Nottingham. I remember doing a night in a club on a Tuesday night. Uh, I said to the, the, the people who would come down, I said, look, this club, you'll have to come down and dress small. Because I said, I don't know, but I have a feeling the doorman might, you know, if you're not dressed to the nines, you know, they're going to use that as an excuse for you to not let you in. So I said, Bert, let me know. So I think I only did it a couple of nights, two weeks. And the amount of people that had come to the other clubs and said, oh, we came down on Tuesday, Dorman won't let us in, and we've got all the right clothes on. So I was like, right, they're playing they're playing that race card in that club. And I just stopped the night. I said, I'm not coming down and playing anymore. I don't want to, you know, I, you know, it's not an issue for me. Um, I want that, that audience in the club. If they've made the effort to come down, let them in. If if you're saying you have a door policy that's alien to me, you don't I'm, want to be I'm part of it. I'm not interested. Not right. interested at all. It, 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 I walked away from it, that. It, 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 that's right. And, and, and you know, when, when we came across it, and, and I have to say, uh, as time went on, we came across it less and less. But it, um, yes, it was in place at one time. It was a throwback from from the sixties because <clears throat> they hadn't had to deal with with this ratio. Of, of uh, coloured people, particularly in you know, Stoke on Trent, for instance, we we did have an area where they seemed to put all the <laughs> the West Indians um, and Asians, but not in sufficient numbers. The first time I experienced this would have been Manchester and Birmingham, and and then you know to a lesser extent, but it did start happening in Nottingham as well. But he's he's an example, which you probably won't can't actually it's, see. It's not it's not picking it up really. That, that, that is a playlist from 1978. 
on I a have. Type, typewriter, right? I have over a hundred playlists that will be in the book. But when you're talking about who played what first, it's down here. We were playing in 1978, Jeff Lorber, Gene Chandler, Aquarian Dream, Donald Bird, Earth, Wind & Fire, Joe Simon, you know, Vincent Montana. It's, it, it's just documentary. Well, that, that'll, bring me on to, that'll bring me on to uh, another point that I've got written down here. There's got to be a record that will spring to mind when I say to you both, I'd like to get an answer from. What would you say became the biggest track that you personally feel responsible for breaking? So I'll come to you, Colin, first. Or a record, I, not the biggest. I, I, have, I have no answer for that. I, yeah. I mean, I mean it, 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 it's, it's the biggest track at, at, at different times. Eddie Parker, Love You Baby, was one of the biggest tracks of the Golden Torch. And then you go to Blackpool Mecca and then you've got a change of record, job opening by the Del Locks. But then when it changed, Gil Scott Heron, the bottle, you know, it, it constantly changing for me. So jazz punk wise, eventually with with the innovation of Japanese imports and, and, and looking at South American acts, Azimuth, Jazz Carnival, these were all records that changed people's lives, changed the attitude of DJs and dancers. So the, the, I, I have those records in every era. What I call... Um, framework records, which I, you know, I can still play OJs, I can still play Azimuth, I can fit them into a set, you know, that also contains new music today. Mm -hmm. And so okay. can John. <laughs> Beautiful. John, uh, an impossible question to answer. Well, it, well, it is, and, and, and Colin's right with what he said, you know, through our careers, you know, we've, we've push the boundaries forward with with new music and like Colin touched upon, you know, records from South America, Azimuth, uh, OPA, uh, or OPA as you like to call them. Banda uh, Black Rio, everybody. Yeah, the, all the Japanese albums uh, that we used to, we used to go to the record stores and uh, that have all these Japanese album, direct to disc albums, so it'd be Sadeo Watanabe, Lee Rittner, um, you know, uh, just um, it was just a magical time that came in and because, so because at, at yeah, this point, at, all. at this point, and it's the first time in history that people like Larkin Arnold, you know, became one of the biggest black executives in in American music with through Arista and places, uh, the record companies, black American people with vision were being given the right jobs. So what you know, this particular period from seventy eight to eighty three is unprecedented, and that's why you still have like the boogie scene and all these other scenes that are just as important to the people who get off on that music as Northern Soul is to the Northern Soul people, out and out jazz dances to those people, house music is to house people. But I've done all those things, and John's done all those things. They're all different rides. So to have individual records you know, that would cover all those options is impossible. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It was a ridiculous question. Forgive me. Uh, let me ask you, I saw a quote earlier, which I, f I thought was extremely fitting and it would enable me to uh, bring up the point. It says competition happens at the bottom. The people at the top are collaborating, you know, very positive um, post that I saw from Mark Wilkinson earlier and it will bring me on to the point about you guys working so closely together there would have been such a strong network of DJs up and down the country and at that time it was all about collaboration wasn't it there was that you there but wasn't a very great... much so I mean I mean particularly the, the 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 point that John made I mean you know I was playing downstairs at the Palais I moved on from the northern didn't do any northern sets at all at that point I'm playing what we, what became called jazz funk at the time didn't really have a name it was just fantastic new music but with with all these elements that attracted you know a mixed race crowd we had a dance floor that you could press a button and spin it round so for somebody close to you that you didn't like and, <laughs> and in your case that would be perfect looking for the right woman you could just keep pressing the button andy and you could go on all night but, come on now don't don't paint that picture of me <laughs> Well, I remember John coming down and, and telling me that he was, I mean, John was a, a top fashion guy as well. He was in Paul Smith, all the right shops and spent a lot of money in that direction as well. But he came down and told me that he was going to make that move in, in, into jazz funk. And from then on, we kept in touch all the time. And eventually when John ended up at Rock City, 
uh, you know, he brought me in there as, as part of the residency on a Friday. He brought me in as kind of semi-consultant and, you know, but he ran an unbelievable uh, operation in, in Rock City. You know, I mean, that was another, another venue where we saw the change from traditional jazz funk into the beginnings of electro, uh, into the beginnings of house. You know, when you think about No Way Back, Adonis and Africa Bambata, we go back to Weeks and Company if you're looking for fun. These were all you know, part of the fabric for that particular club. 1,200 people on a Friday night, 15, 1,600 on an all day, separate jazz room for the jazz dancers. People like Paul Murphy coming along from London. It was just blown up. Birmingham, Nottingham, Manchester, Leeds, Bradford, it just blew up and it was an unbelievably exciting time and it was just uh, you, you, you know the music was there every week any money you earned you think you go in the record shop thinking you've got a few bob and you'd come out penniless again absolutely every week. skint Andy we wouldn't go to one shop no we no we wouldn't go shopping one day it was yeah. like having a, needing a, a drug fix almost you know we were out hunting records 24 7 colin and i would be on the phone two three times a week comparing notes on records that we picked up because but, but, you know, right. we, had a, we, we had a responsibility to deliver the best records we could find to yeah. that audience that came to see us whether you know you know you also got to remember that when the all dayers were in, in full swing there was one weekend we're in Birmingham, then there was one in Nottingham, there might have been Leicester, that there could have been uh, Sheffield, Leeds, Bradford, Huddersfield. We were on the road every weekend and coaches were up and down the M1, the A1, um, you know, east to west. And we had an obligation to deliver the best sets we could find. And we were demons for finding records, and we still are to this day. Because of the way... We, and it's all the way through. That's right. We were brought up on a rare soul scene, which, which actually put the emphasis on that. And so when the new releases came in, the anal approach was, was almost double. I mean, if you take... Um, I mean, Jonathan will know in, in Nottingham, but I mean, the first time I went to Nottingham to a record shop was selected disc when it was on Arkwright Street, you know, coming off the train with Keith Mitchell in those days. But you worked and, and, and bought records in Palladium. If you go to, I bought records from Kev Roberts in Nottingham. If you go to Birmingham, uh, then it was um, Discary. It was Jazz and Swing. It was Graham War in the Oasis. It was Steve Glover in the Oasis. And what at, the, at one point, I would get on a train in Stoke-on-Trent at seven o'clock in the morning and go to London to do the London shops, whether it be Virgin, whether it be Groove Records, whether it be City Sounds, do the London shops, get back on the train, and then I had a choice. I either got off in Birmingham and went there, or I got off, got my car and went to Manchester on the way to Blackpool. So a record I bought in in the morning in London is going to go on the deck that night in Blackpool. Were there any, at this moment in time, with you guys flying the flag and, uh, you know, clearly having nationwide acclaim, were you the uh, the darlings of any of the UK record labels at this point? Were you being furnished with promos? I, I, I was very popular. I was I was thrown off almost every record list for not filling in the, the ridiculous <laughs> amount of feedback that they wanted, and I didn't really care. I, I had a, a massive running row with Morgan Kahn when he first started, which was in a, in a magazine called Disco, which kept us both in business, actually. kept us both in plenty of work. Um, he walked into my club in Rafters and wanted me to play um, Mantis, Dance It Freestyle, which was six, seven months old by then. He was putting it out in the UK. We were an import club. We didn't care about what was right. going on. So that didn't work. And he was thrown out of the club accordingly. But um, I got on great with, with Morgan after that. I mean, we, it, we both had a passion. So, yeah, it, 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 like John says, every week we, we needed to go down every avenue and try and find every record. And sometimes uh, through right. the the foibles of, of importing, um, you know, I'd find myself having to go to London down the King's Road to see Tony Monson in his shop because he'd got the latest Japanese jazz imports. 
and and that you know that could take the whole day just to get just to get those records and being locked in jazz and swing they had the two shops in birmingham were side by side one was full of stock and one was an open shop so if you wanted to look through the stock they used to lock you in there the same way that when i used to go to bradford market the guy used to blindfold us drive us to the warehouse lock us wow. in the warehouse then come back four hours later and then by that time we then we readjust to the lights Blind, and blindfold you for fear of someone blindfold. for fear of someone going and blagging so it. We uh, didn't, yeah, so we didn't know where the warehouse was. Yeah, yeah. Um, we we didn't know where we were anyway. And <laughs> 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 Bradford, you know, we had no clue. What a fascinating story! What a fascinating story. Um, yeah, so you, you saying it's funnily enough, I've got another note here to say about traveling that we will talk on to John uh, yourself uh, uh, because there's still not um, mention of the strong connection with the record labels for, for yourself and the promos and well, you know it, it, pl it pluggers, early thing. pluggers. It was it was a similar thing for me where you know record companies um, would furnish us with records. Some companies you'd get on really well with, uh, and, uh, and others you wouldn't. Uh, you know, I'm not going to name names, but... Oh, you must, you must. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose... Fred, Fred, Fred Dove was the toughest guy at Warner Brothers, the toughest <laughs> guy to get on his list. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, you know, Fred was one of the hardest people to, to sort of get the tracks you wanted out of him. Uh, he'd have fantastic things, but... You were you were given some real sticklers to try and make as big records, and you, your heart would sink because you'd get a package from him, you'd open it up, and you'd play it, and you'd be like, "My crowd's never going to dance to this record." Never. I can't put my name to that. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so you had this running battle, but there was other people uh, at other record labels that actually came up. To the Midlands and the North, saw what was going on, understood what we were doing, and then we got looked after by those. You know, so it was, you know, it, it worked. It worked better as a personal relationship rather than course. you know getting the records and then being expected to fill all them in and post them. But you're having a laugh. You really yeah, were. We haven't got time. For that. I, 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 I have to say I'm no good at it now. I mean, they send me the stuff, and if, uh, the, the, the good thing from their point of view is, as I have to fill it in before it'll let me download it, I have to send something back. So normally I say happy birthday or something like that, you know, and just just get the <laughs> yeah. The most anyway. ridiculous, the most ridiculous thing on those promo reaction sheets are your opinion. This is before you get the opportunity to download it. Uh, yeah. Track title, your opinion, marks out of ten. Uh, dance yeah. floor reaction. It's like, why the fuck are you asking me that? <laughs> I don't have the record to play. You. <laughs> Excuse my language. I'm swearing on my own no, podcast. No, no, no. And then the same with you know, you get records sent um, to, to send a reaction form back, and then they want your sort of top ten or top twenty uh, of what you were currently playing in the clubs you were playing, and it varied so much. And they thought. You know, for some reason, you know, they thought records were going to gradually go up the charts like they were in the pop charts, and we'd be playing things for four and five and six weeks. The turnaround of records was so fast. You know, was you, it really? That's a, that's actually in, an interesting point because with there being so few copies around at the time, there's you know, people complain now about the shelf life of records being so short. You must have broke, spent weeks breaking records that not many other people had, surely? Or was it, oh, oh too many people have got this yeah, thing? Certainly. There, there was, you know, you know, we, we, Colin and I would talk and, you know, if we'd both picked something up that we felt really strongly about, I, you know, I was, certainly for me at Rock City, I was, I was in a very fortunate position where I could go into the club, put the sound system on, play a 12, stand in the middle of the dance floor and go, this is a bomb. And I already knew what was going to happen before it happened on a Friday night because I hadn't got, you know, a stack system in the house that I was playing the records on. I'd got an almighty sound system in the club. 
you know, and it wasn't a million miles away from what Larry Levan was doing at the Paradise Garage where he would go in there and, and, and test records out on the system. You know, unbeknown to me, I was doing exactly the same thing at Rock City. So That's the soundbite. That was the soundbite that I've got. I was Nottingham's Larry Levan. Thank you. I've got that. That's got that. There you go. <laughs> well, but but, but it, it, it's right because I mean even even the sixties clubs. I mean uh, the wheel. Uh, you know, a combination of the equipment. I mean, you've got to bear in mind the equipment was restricted by the knowledge at different times. But the twisted wheel, uh, the golden torch in particular, where you could hear records at the golden torch. Uh, you know, some kids commented to me at the time and years later that they bought that record and then took it home. It didn't sound the same. It, because it didn't. And that would have been the same for Paradise Garage, as John says. That no, they're not going to sound the same. But then you've got the added trickery of Levan and more UK DJs starting to use two copies. I mean, we started to use two copies of things. And, you know, like, uh, uh, what was it, Dancing in the Space, got that fantastic break in it. So you could keep that going for 10 minutes, you know, just keep using the break and then back in. And that was the beginning of it. Well, the first DJ to turn up at Rock City with two boxes of records. No LPs, just 12s, opened the box, and the same records were in each box. And that was Graham Park. And he cost £30. My goodness, John, that was too much, wasn't it, at the time? <laughs> but, but that was the first time I'd seen somebody you know, make that move to to actually introduce the combination of two records and, and, and start that you know that next level of mixing that came in te- you know, on the tech side. Uh-huh. I always, I always remember reading an interview some time ago. Uh, they were talking about there was a, a big furore about uh, northern DJs could really, you know, mix proper and it sounded great, and the southern DJs couldn't mix at all. Kind of thing. Is that is that no, something? No that, comment. There you go. <laughs> No, I, I'm not going to draw any. I'm not going to draw you to agree on that. Uh, good evening, Stephen. Thank you for commenting. And, and again, good evening to everyone that's with us. Uh, okay, so I've I've answered a lot of these questions here that I wanted to. You shared a photo, um, <clears throat> Colin. Some great photographs. I, I, I wanted to ask about was the uh, hair and the mustaches coordinated back in the day? That's a bit of a jest. <laughs> and, uh, but, <laughs> It's, there was no phone calls made that <laughs> the day before about what we were going to wear, and it it, it didn't. It, I'd, I'd seen that photograph probably six months after it was taken. Didn't even draw that conclusion. It was only years later when uh, mustaches weren't a thing <laughs> that somebody went, "You've all got one." <laughs> so, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and another one of the photos that you shared a gentleman on there um because there are a lot of um really influential and important people down the years uh someone i'd like to get to talk to eventually is mr cleveland anderson he's been cleveland around a long anderson, time and yeah, very yeah. very important when 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 you look at the people on that photograph mike shaft who was a phenomenon in manchester and you know when he was on piccadilly radio he followed andy peebles in andy peebles had a huge soul show on piccadilly uh, he went to radio one and, and mike took the show over mike was phenomenal on the radio and he he was the first guy that allowed me to go in on the show and do what he called a jazz break which started off as three records ended up being half an hour because you were getting participation from the audience on, on the telephones and you know information and where can we go to hear this music so mike shaft is on there cleveland anderson was one of the london djs along with paul trouble anderson uh, he preceded paul trouble we, we brought trouble to birmingham we brought paul murphy to birmingham for the jazz we brought tim westwood to birmingham uh, and occasionally uh, he would appear in, in the north or in Peterborough uh, would be the uh, the late Steve Walsh, uh, who I got on very well with. I mean, it, you know, but he, he was determined to crash into Chris Hill and the Mafia back in those days. But yeah, there was there was there were scenes within scenes. And when you talk about the um, the racial situation, I mean, if you look at uh, most of the Mafia photographs, most of their gigs were predominantly white people. Whereas in London, at Crackers, was this completely different scene run by George Power and Rome and all those early guys down there, you know, who brought in people like Paul Trouble Anderson, Cleveland Anderson as well, bringing in, you know, the more black element, if you will, the the, the barely breaking even, the Leroy Burgess sound, you know, that whole feeling. 
uh, that was really looking back at it, the beginning of House, Patrick Adams, you know, that sound was unique, which I'd been playing since the 70s at Blackpool Mecca with Atmosphere Strut and records like that. It, 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 it just became an absolute uh, phenomenon. Um, what, what was the other? There was a, there was a huge uh, band that Patrick Adams did um, that signed to Atlantic. I can't remember the name of the band now, but it, it, it yeah, it, it it all developed. And for me, there was a, there was a distinct playlist difference between going to a gig, uh, you know, that, that Chris Hill and those guys had put on, and Pete Tong was involved with them, and Froggy, and then the music that you would hear. You know, we actually brought George Power up to Castanelli's in Standish. Young lady in here earlier from Standish. Um, you know, we brought George up there. We brought the Birmingham DJs up there because they they brought something different again. And Birmingham, as I say, was one tough ass place. Uh huh. It's lovely. Yeah, I love to hear that. Uh, Steve Blackwax is asking: Were you referencing Cloud One, maybe with the Patrick Adams? Yeah, were... Cloud One. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cloud One atmosphere stuff. I mean, all, all those all those early uh, Patrick Adams stuff. Um, it, it, oh, what was it? Sign was another band. Uh, on Prelude, in fact, uh, you know, they're, they're just let me do my thing, all, all those, you know, there, there was so Mr. Blind Man, so many great records, uh, Carmichael, Patrick Adams, you know, just just that whole sound, which was adopted more uh, by the black crowd than the white crowd initially, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Derek Inman is saying Flying High, Dave Furs is referencing Chris Hill at the Ritz as well, years before. Uh, you'd mentioned earlier about a responsibility with regards to getting the, the biggest and the best music to the public, Jonathan. Um, yes. the, the energy that you needed to, to sustain that for, for many years, um, that, would have, that would have continued. And we've spoken, both Colin and I, with Frenchie as well, uh, with yourself. And then the, we joked earlier about, you know, the advent of, of house music and the rave culture, Th then the whole landscape completely changed. Was there any, um, ever any times where you guys were tempted or forced to have to water down what you were doing to, to keep working? Or was that never an option for either of you? It was, certainly for me, um, You've got to look back, and I made decisions at Rock City um, and that were based around a couple of things. Um, was oh, we, lose him. we lose him at the most inopportune moment. Start yeah, again, John. Yeah. I've got you now. So, I've got um, you now. Paul Mason was the person who brought me in uh, to work at Rock City. And you know, I thank him for giving me that opportunity because if he hadn't have come down to the club that I was doing on a Monday night in Nottingham and heard me play and gone, I want you to come up here and DJ at Rock City. You know, we're changing this club. Uh, we're putting a brand new sound system in it. Um, if, if it wasn't for him coming down to that club night that I did at Camelot on a Monday night and asking me that question, I would have just been in a small club, you know, with an appetite for records, but no real outlet to play them. So, you know, I, I thank him for that. And, you know, everybody who was involved with Rock City at that time for giving me that opportunity to go and work there and put together a legacy. Uh, it wasn't intended, but it ended up being where people reference Rock City as, you know, this amazing club, which at the time, you know, I was just thankful that I'd got a club with a great sound system in and I was able to start, first of all, do the all dayers because as soon as I started working there, you know, I said to Paul, right, I want to put on, the, you know, the jazz funk all dayers. So from them being at the Palais for many, many years, they were shipped up the road all the DJs came and we started the old days um, at Rock City. And it was only, we had to wait another nine months, well, six, seven months before I could start doing the Friday nights. Um, 
purely because the club had got this idea of what they wanted playing on a Friday night. It was more sort of like post-new wave electronic music and that kind of like, I think the reasoning behind that, because Paul Mason had gone to see Mel DJ, the Blue Note at Derby, and Mel would play this real mixture of music that, you know, was some things from America, uh, you know, like Dinosaur L, uh, along with Kraftwerk, Depeche Mode, that electronic sound that was, you know, the synth pop sound, the, or the, the infancy of new wave that was being, uh-huh. uh, you know, coming out in this country. And that's what I was, you know, that's what he wanted to do on a Friday night in a big club. And the Blue Note was a small club. And it just didn't really work. And he got to sort of Christmas. And that's a poor, I said, we're not getting more than 350 people. And the upstairs room at Rock City, you've been to it, Andy. It's a big room. It holds 1,200 people. Put 350 people in there, you're like, that was a long night when I used to DJ all night because it was just hard work. You couldn't create an atmosphere and you couldn't even fill a dance floor because there wasn't enough people in there to fill it. And I said, look, this is not what I want to do. This is what I want to do on a Friday night. I said, let me decide. Let me do what I think is going to work here. I said, it will involve a change of audience, but there'll be a lot more people. And we know we changed the music policy just after Christmas, you know, and it was word of mouth. We did a few flyers for it. It wasn't some great big opening where we put adverts everywhere in, you know, Black Echoes, Blues of Soul, da, 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 da. none of that. We did it from the street and worked it up. And within three months, there was 1,200 people in this club every Friday night. And the policy was there was no old records played. Everything was brand new. So the doors had opened, and I would, for the first couple of hours, I'd play everything that I'd got that week. So when people were walking, they were hearing new records. You know, a few people would come and ask what they are, you know, they'd settle into the club and then I'd wait until there was a time where I felt there was enough people in the club and then we would light the touch paper. So we had a fantastic lighting rig in there with a laser. We had two giant video screens that we could run videos on. Uh, you know, we had a Sirwin Vega sound system, which was the, the one reason why I went there. Uh, and... You know, we just turn the system up and drop a tune that was big from the week before. And that was the touch paper that was lit and off we went. And it was just, the, you know, I, I wish I'd take more photographs at the time. I wish I'd recorded the night. But, you know, you live for the moment. You don't. You I don't. Think, I, think, I, don't I don't think anybody did. I mean, you, you no, we didn't, put, did we? You can take more photographs in one night now than was taken over the last forty years in the UK on, on in clubland. I mean, it, yeah, it 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 it's probably a regret for all of us because you know that way people c- could actually see what was going on. But when you think about Rock City and what you did change, I mean, we had you know Dee Dee Bridgewater, we had Kenny Burke, we had M Two May, we had Africa Bombarda, we had Run DMC, we had Mantronix. You just it, it it was just unbelievable, but, you know, and 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 that was. You know, that was following on from all the success of, of the live acts being introduced in the 70s, you know, yeah. through, through the Ritz and through, uh, you know, Manchester. It was just, a, well, and also Birmingham, uh, Birmingham McCarno, some major acts there. And in fact, the, you know, the Ingram family, I remember them coming to Birmingham, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was a phenomenal time. And um, I think Paul Mason does deserve uh, the credit that you, you're you bestowing on him because he then went to Manchester and it took him about six months to adapt. Well, then the Hacienda became the most important club in the UK with DJs flying in in helicopters. And, and, and no, I wouldn't be in one of those helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was relevant at a time. You know, we had some amazing nights there. We had some unbelievable acts on. You look through the list of, of, 
you know, people forget that, you know, you, you, we've touched upon it earlier on about the evolution of, of music in this country and the, 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 the start of house music. Well, you know, there's a, there's a poster that, I've, that we've posted up a couple of times where we put an all day on at Rock City and we had Larry Sherman from Trax Records came over and Marshall Jefferson, Larry <laughs> Heard, um, you know, Frankie Knuckles was DJing that day. This was way before, uh, this track's tour went into the limelight in London on the, I think, the, the, I think it did the limelight either on the Friday or the Saturday night. I remember you saying before. And, and Yeah, and it was like, nobody really got it. And then they came to Rock City on the Sunday, sold out, 1,700 people. <laughs> and Larry Heard was interviewed on Radio 1 to do with the, uh, the, the, you know, I think it was called the Roots of House Music or something like that. I have it somewhere on a tape that somebody, I didn't know about it, you know, it was something that was uh, given to me years later where he... Uh, with very fond memories sight of that day where, you know, he went on stage and everybody knew his records and was just going crazy and screaming and jumping on down where the night before the limelight in London, you know, it was just like, well, you know, you were just an unknown entity right. that nobody was really bothered about. Uh, and, and that Sunday he said, I now know how Michael Jackson feels like when he goes out on stage. He said, <laughs> this perception that we all got was phenomenal. You know, and it was only... Because, because, because by that time, those records were part of the fabric. I mean, you know, Marshall yeah. Jefferson, you know, all, all those early track records were part of the fabric as well, along with, you know, DJ International. We, we were banging those records hard, John. I mean, and it, you know, that was probably the only place where... Anybody was getting a reaction, you know. When 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 you look back and uh, and, and and think about the the, the changes, uh, you know, the you you got the dancers that you connected with there, the, the yeah. Rock City crew. You've got the you know, the change to bring somebody like Van Barter, Run DMC, Mantronics, who tried to buy the turntables off us, off you, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because that turntable, that Technics turntable, wasn't out in the states, you know. So. No, I don't think they had. I don't think any of those DJs had experienced that, even even in the states at that point. So, so in in those terms, Rock City. I mean, those acts weren't booked for Birmingham, weren't booked for Manchester. But in in this particular instance, in terms of you know having a piece of history, that that was a massive, massive night in in Nottingham. Yeah, with, with that, you know, with, you know, we just booked things at the time that I knew was right for the all dayers. You know, not realizing, you know, years later, the significance of, you know, these these nights that we had on. Well, the the you know, I mean, I mean the, this this moments like that in, in in all DJ careers, I suppose. But I would cite nineteen eighty six Bogner Regis, where we went to. Yeah, yeah. Um, we both went there. I came drove home to Nottingham. We both went down on the coach. Yeah. Um, you know. And, and I mean, Andy was talking about coaches uh, years ago. I mean, when John Grant and myself first played in Scotland, we took five coaches with us. Now, if you get five people in the car, you're doing well. <laughs> five coaches and not That's even right. the same. So yeah, well, I drove over to you that for, for that weekend, and, and that was the first time either of us had been down to Showstopper. Uh, and I DJed uh, two jazz sets with with Dr. Bob Jones. I played what we were playing at Rock City. And Chris Hill stood at the side of the set all the way through it. And he, he said, yeah, that's, that's very good, you know, because everybody was dancing. It was it was a great uh, session. And then he said, but we're not going with the house music group. You know, we're the mafia. We're, we're sticking with soul. This is bloody soul, you know. <laughs> this is soul music made by people who've got passion. That's what means soul. So I went back to the chalet. And, and John will remember that. I think I had the paramedics out twice that weekend just to keep them busy. But I got a knock on the door, and, and this guy said to me, he said, I've got a chap here. What, he, he wants to talk about the record you've just been playing in that room. And it was Paul Oakenfold who came in to look through my boxes of records and, you know, Grant on Precision and all those early tracks. 
and and that an eye opener for everybody. But also that weekend, a conversation with Nicky Holloway. Did he think that the people from the north would be interested in going to Ibiza? Bear in the mind, there was no Ibiza at this stage. I said the people in the north won't even go to Margate. Never mind to Ibiza. We don't get on airplanes in the north like you do in London. So I, I you know, I poo pooed that. But also a conversation that weekend with a young fella called Alex Lowe's, who used to come to Blackpool Mecca. And he came across to me at the bar and he said, Colin, I'm going to start my own weekenders. And he did. And the rest is fucking history. Yeah. Ah, that just gave me goosebumps. That's a, that, that was one weekend, 1986. Yeah. John was there. House music, clear with the band playing live. Your body working. Uh, <laughs> They played two sets, one on each day. I did a radio show that I've still got with Giles Peterson, who kept popping up out of his seat and saying, what's this? What's this? What's this? <laughs> because what John and I had grown up with on the rare soul scene was an expectancy because of who you were to play records or to play some, some records each time people came to see you that were going to make them, wow, what's that? I need that. And that's what grew it. So we then took as, all that. As opposed, as opposed to what was the uh, way of thinking down south, what was their meth method, would down, you down say? Down south, it was very much still, I, I mean, going back to the early period, very much that, that James Brown tip, and, and they can have all the credit for that. And then it, if, if you look at the way that Northern Soul developed into sort of more mid-tempo and what they, what they call crossover, in London, it became rare groove. You know, I mean, there was a different feel to it. And London had the advantage, and you'll know better than me, but I would say London had the advantage in breaking lesser-known music and new music because their pirate radio stations were a lot more on the case. And, uh -huh. you know, I, I, I tried to do a couple in Birmingham and ended up running away from guys in bloody <laughs> cars and vans trying to pinch me records. Well, that wasn't Was that, fucking was that with Frenchy? Was that with Frenchie? Yeah. <laughs> and, and people saying to you, could you go to the top and put the aerial on? No, I, uh -uh. I don't go that high. <laughs> well, actually, let, let me, I'm going to take a sharp change of direction when you say you don't go about that high. And we, we spoke about helicopters into the Hacienda. I had asked you before, uh, because I've uh, tried, I've asked to bring you over to the vocal booth weekend and you very yeah, yeah. graciously declined. Is Do you have a fear of flying or you just don't yeah, like to travel? I, 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 have, I have an irrational fear of flying, but now connected to health reasons uh, and the pressure changes in an aeroplane that might affect my health. So okay. uh, I've, I've had instances of this when I've, uh, when, when I've had periods of, of uh, severe illness um, in the 80s. I was taken out for about 12 months and about eight years no, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I was taken out for another 12 months. They said that was a TIA. So I'm I'm just not willing to risk it. But the the, the crazy thing really is my father never got on an aeroplane until he was 61. And every time he got on one, he came out in a rash. And the only reason he was going is because my mother had discovered foreign holidays and she was going and he was coming with her, whether he liked it or not. So, <laughs> but I, th I thought, well, maybe when I'm 61, <laughs> something will change. But it, it well, never we've, did. Got a few, I, we've got a few years yet. We've got a few yeah, years this, before you get to 61. This week I've been offered, offered gigs in four countries. I, I get offered uh, foreign gigs all the time. And Giles is very enthusiastic to get me out there. I'm 70 years old now. And, you know, it's... It, it, the passion has not dimmed at all towards music. Tomorrow, I'm going to hear some music I've never heard before in my life. There's nothing more exciting than that. Uh -huh. And you wouldn't consider jumping on the Euro Tunnel, Eurostar, and it's it's, it's been discussed. But uh, I mm -hmm. mean, the same that you know, fatigue and and uh, stamina. You know, may, maybe not. Maybe not. Okay, I understand. I understand. Well, thank you for clarifying that for me. I, I knew that, but it's just in case people were wondering why they don't get to see you in these far flung places because they would really love to see you. Well, I, yeah, Bamberg. I'm, I'm in Italy, uh, many gigs offered in Italy, Spain, um, Sweden, particularly, um, particularly when Function was going on, um, even Australia. Yeah, I'm, I'm in, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm signed to Joey Negro's label for the for, for my jazz compilations, and and Joey goes to Australia once a year, so that that would be a nice option. I could get myself a cap and a, and a, and a flowery shirt, and I could go with him. But uh, no, thirteen hours on an airplane, no.
<laughs> well, you mentioned you uh, mentioned and- a, you mentioned about Joey Negro, uh, the Dave Lee. He's um, he's enjoying uh, fantastic uh, success at the moment. A newfound energy with his social his social output. I've noticed yeah. on that. Very, uh, very funny. I mean, no one realised that inside Dave was a stand up comedian, and and now he does these videos. They're absolutely fantastic. I absolutely love them to bits. And and you, you, the DJs waving their arms and opening a record, uh, just just fantastic stuff. And I, I'm I'm really pleased for him because he's kind of reinvented himself again. Game. Mm-hmm. And and for me, in terms of production, in terms of uh, you know attention to detail, his work is phenomenal. And mm-hmm. and when you've got the likes of Glenn Underground and Louis Vega acknowledging that, then you know you don't get any bigger accolades than that. And he plays you know fantastic disco music. He, he's never hidden the fact he's always he was always into collecting the boogie. Dave used to ring me in the eighties every Wednesday night to talk about. Uh, you know, can is this on a twelve? Can I get that on a twelve? You know, and cold cut as well. He used to call and and you have know, similar conversations. It, it, you know, it's a learning process. And if you think that I started DJing in sixty seven and Dave started in seventy eight, so there's a bit of catching up there. Mm-hmm. It's um, it but it's it's phenomenal to see him have that success. And my connection with him w- was to do some compilation albums for Zed Records. So I sent in a soul one. Uh, I sent in a compilation that was going to be house music that wasn't on vinyl because obviously with the track source era, so much stuff not getting released on vinyl, which records that I played over the previous five years that could make a comp. But they were so tough to get the licenses. In the end, this disco house label put out a jazz compilation that was very successful and I've done two more since and there's another one coming. Mm-hmm. And now and I've got my own label. I was so just I about to say, own. and your own label, which is doing really great. You're you're championing um, homegrown talent. I say homegrown, yeah. but yeah, well, well, yeah, it kind of it, it evolved organically. That the, the first album we did, the jazz compilation, we picked on one label to make it easier in the licensing aspect. And Muse, although Muse, the company that owned Muse, had no idea where any of the master tapes were. We managed to do a deal and 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 get them out. And so the first album, the second album, because my radio show was becoming successful on Worldwide FM, um, and UK acts were sending me music, and I'm I'm loving some of this music. So I I, I just said that I'm going to start including it into the compilation on on number two, <laughs> and then on number three. I think there's eight or ten tracks on there that a UK based fantastic music and we've got more coming on the next one and i'm i'm doing i'm coming up to release two more so that'll be eight and by the end of the end of this year hopefully 10 and next year we've got about 10 more schedules so it, it's it's brilliant it's brilliant you know th- these artists can't get can't get record deals can't get uh, you know record companies not interested you know then they're, they're not mtv friendly they're not friendly musically so but there is a market still out there and particularly uh, the vinyl still a market for mm-hmm. vinyl. Oh, yeah, it, it has it has a, a level, but there is still a market out there. But it gets these guys known. I mean, when you look at the the amount of championing on this style of music that jazz has done over the years, all around the world, it's phenomenal. Mm-hmm. You know, there's not many people who've opened so many doors as Peterson. I get yeah, uh, Jonathan. As we're listening to Colin, still very passionate, still very driven uh, yourself. Uh, kind of pulled back from the DJing. We we spoke about if you're DJing now, it's only vinyl. You're not going out touching the digital. When you when you listen to Colin talking and his passion for the music, do you do you do you think? Well, I li- I listen to him and I think, how has he still got the energy? You know, it's incredible. Well, it, you know, <laughs> he has, and, and you know, for, you know, all credit due. Yeah, I, I suppose it's circumstances. My, you know. My children are younger than Collins, you know. You know, I, I married later in life. You know, situations change. I can't justify going out. You know, I have a data. I have a full time job. I can't then go out every weekend DJing. So I've kind of taken the passion still there. You know, I still buy a lot of records. I still listen to a lot of music, but I don't go out and DJ every weekend because. I'm working every week and, you know, I've got family and, you know, home to uh, be involved. To, to, with. Con- to contend with. 
I get you. Well, <clears throat> listen, Malcolm Stretch, as you say, is a pure love of music and listening to you both is truly an emotional journey. Uh, we could we could really easily sit here for hours and hours chatting. I, I, I'm actually supposed to be going on a book club uh, somewhere in a little while. So more personal development. Well, we can do part two. It's not a we, we can do part two, part three, and part four. I'll get your Cleveland I, Anderson to come on. I'll sort yeah. that out for you if you want to. So, speak what, to him regularly. Think, I think what really needs to be what I would love to do is talk to Cleveland Anderson. I would love to talk to Graham War. Uh, Colin, can you facilitate that? Because he's, he's, he's a very it's, shy it's, guy, right? Great, great, Graham is quite reclusive, but yeah, I'll try. I'll try. Certainly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm Graham Moore for me is 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 massively important. Yeah, yeah, because he got not not just as a DJ, but also as the record shop, and and also I mean, I mean, his wife uh, you know tried to get into the DJing as well. So that you know, one of the early female DJs. So yeah, he, he had you know, Graham had massive passion, some some heavy conversation, but don't forget. That Graham was also uh, a guy, who, one of the early guys going to America, turning up rare records and, that were played on the Northern Soul scene, some very crucial records, and also DJed at the famous Catacombs Club in Birmingham, uh, mm -hmm. in, sorry, in Wolverhampton. Um, so, yeah, ab absolutely relevant. And Cleveland brings that uh, trouble, Anderson, George Power, neither of those with us anymore, but Cleveland will have the story. Um, and yeah, I got, always got on very well with Cleveland, you know, and, and that picture was taken at an old day in Manchester, at, a, at Tiffany's in Manchester on Oxford Road, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, and, and everybody, you had to have a moustache or else you couldn't be a DJ. <laughs> well, Martin, Martin Brotherton is saying, thank, please thank Colin for all his podcasts, continuing to educate the masses and keep everyone up to date. And uh, we are getting a call to bring Ian Dewhurst on. I have actually spoken to Ian, uh, you know, yeah. to try, try, try and he's, make that he's, happen. He's, he's, he's just had a major operation, so it'll be a few weeks before you get Ian. Yeah, okay. a major okay. operation. Right, okay. Well, we wish you, we wish you all the best. Um, gentlemen, there is, I don't know what I can say, you know, really, I, I am... <laughs> In, in your debt for allowing me to take up your time and the people who have watched this uh, have been with you on your journey and they've got just yeah, as much yeah, energy I, I, for I you. I think it does. I, I, you know, I think one of the main differences is, is <clears throat> you know, for John and myself is we, we've been able to traverse all the musical changes and, and yet still remain relevant in, in, in certain areas. And, you know, from 60s soul to 70s soul to jazz funk, um, to disco soul, what, whatever it's been, and then to move into house music, uh, and then beyond your know, soulful house and all the variations that we see now. Kids have got so much choice, it's, it's unreal. So to create a club situation that we had years ago where all these famous clubs that I'd been connected with and other major DJs are connected with, they were resident clubs, so you'd be there two, three, four, five years. People would come to that club every week. You would build up a foundation of records the same way that we talked about Levan. There was Paradise Garage Records. There was records that, you know, from Louis Vegas uh, residencies. Those residencies, people are coming, everybody's at that age. It's all very much a part of it. So it's most of my gigs now, uh, you know, whether they're festivals, whether they're gigs, are, are based on being a guest DJ. So I have to work out where we're going musically and what I want to say in, in that particular situation. So it, DJ now is completely different to you know, what I've maybe got a reputation for and the same for John. They, you know, he built his reputation up on resident clubs of which Rock City was, was an absolute pinnacle. Mm -hmm. When you say DJ is different now, is it, it must still give you, you still come away feeling as enriched at the end of a set. I, th I think I think occasionally you go out and 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 you have to accept that it's a job, um, but a lot of the time I go out and if I can play what I've set out to play or even close to what I've set out to play, that will, yeah, that that's the buzz and, and and the buzz is you know constant music and chasing music all the time, still buying records, still buying digital. No, no matter what format isn't important to me, but I respect formats with Northern Soul. I respect formats with jazz dance. People want to want to see the vinyl. That's fine. So, you know, you go out of your way to, you know, to make those things happen, to be part and respectful to all these scenes that have been around 30, 40, 50 years. Mm, 
Well, it feels, thank you. Thank you again. It feels kind of wrong for me to cut this short, but cut it short, I must. Uh, thank you again for, for your time. Tell, you. me, tell me about the, the book. How closer are we to the book, Colin? Let's not talk about the book. <laughs> what, challenges, what challenges are you finding? Let's have another drink and wonder if England will ever win another cricket match. No, no. no. I, the, the, okay. the, 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 challenge, the challenges are that you approach a book in the same way that, that Jonathan and I approach music. And that's, I've, I've written sometimes two, three chapters, and then I'll speak to somebody who has got a parallel or a different view, but very relevant. So then I have to come back and rewrite that piece, and, and that goes on forever. So at some point, I've got to be, yeah, I've got to start chopping it up because my book contains all four of those musical changes, all four relevant records in each of those areas. We've talked about, you know, a, a minuscule amount of records tonight, but, you know, I want to be able to put the book out with at least 100 relevant records in each of those sections with the album covers, with the stories that go behind them. Mm -hmm. I'm giving right. credit where it's due to the people who either found those records or broke those records. Well, it's it's very commendable, but please do not find yourself with analysis paralysis, otherwise it's never going to get out there. Well, that, yes, yes. That's, that's, that, yeah. I've, I've had that thrown at me, analysis paralysis, yeah. <laughs> it can happen, yeah, yeah. Okay, gentlemen, thank you so much. John, thank you, brother. Colin, thank you both very much. Welcome. Take care, Andy. See you soon. It's dark okay. over there. It's still light here. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's gone dark. See you later, gents. Take care. Wow. Uh, that was great, wasn't it? I know you all loved that, everybody. Um, Colin, thank you, my friend. See you soon. Uh, right. To everyone that has been watching, let me see if I can give you all a few shouts. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Martin says Colin needs to do a book, as you just heard me asking him. It's been planned for quite a while. Schooly, respect, brother. Mr. Rogers, Emily, uh, every, uh, my screen's freezing. I can't scroll up. I know there's been quite a few of you watching. Thank you for your comments. And I know there will be a hell of a lot of people referencing this back. These conversations all began from a very selfish point of view. I wanted to fill in a few gaps of myself, of my early Birmingham days, going out to the powerhouse um, and seeing Colin way before I even knew who he was. Uh, dancing to Poor Trouble Anderson before I even knew who he was. Simon Bay, Sly Smith, and so on and so forth. Over the course of the last two years, I've been speaking to some incredible guests who have really um, opened my eyes and put the pieces together of the history, and it's been received really well. So thank you for all of the great comments. Colin rang me earlier to congratulate me on the interview that I did last week. Well, it was actually this week on Monday with Marcia Carr. Uh, you know, what more can a man ask for to be given praise from someone in such high esteem? Uh, you can see on the screen here, my next conversation will be Monday coming. A gentleman, uh, I think I've called him the King of Bel Air, Robin Holland. Uh, that's going to be a very interesting conversation indeed. He's one of the nicest guys that I've ever met on my journey. Uh, he's one of the most respected DJs out there. And yet you'll get to find out why there's a stripper's heel on the graphic. Okay, so I'll say no more than that. Thank you all for your comments, guys. Uh, I've actually been banned off of YouTube this week. Usually I broadcast uh, on YouTube, but by not being able to broadcast on YouTube, I've realized that I am actually getting a lot more of you joining and conversing with me on Facebook. So maybe I'll, I'll do joint broadcasts to YouTube and Facebook again. I'll give that a try. Go on to youtube.com forward slash DJ Andy Ward and you can find out all the past conversations I've done, including over two hours with Colin and uh, Neil Rushton and also a conversation with Jonathan where we talk about Rock City in depth and so much more. Uh, if you have been enjoying this, then you can subscribe to the channel at youtube.com forward slash DJ Andy Ward. Thank you to all of my access members. And uh, if you need anything website related, graphics related, or promo videos, then I am your man. Thank you, folks. I've got to rush off and do a book club. See you later.